Welcome back to Project Sunday. So today we are going to do a project with my new old sewing machine. Now I'm sure you'll remember this. I picked it up at Lutz's Antiques about a week ago. And this is a, a vintage portable machine, probably from the late 1940s. I think it is post-World War II, can't be sure. It could actually date from a little earlier, but probably not as late as the 1950s. Uh, it did need a little bit of attention, and the fix I use um, is a fix you might be able to take advantage of for some of your projects. So, when we come back. So my new old sewing machine was my birthday present to myself this year. It's a beautiful machine. Uh, I've really wanted a machine I could love. I sew. I don't like modern machines. I really don't. I have not liked modern machines. I resent them. It's like it's personal to me. I know that sounds so crazy, but if I sit down in front of a modern machine, the first thing I do is look at it and say, I hate you. Uh, that's no way to start a project. Um, on the other hand, my new old machine, first thing I said to that was, oh, I love you. I've missed you so much. And it's because I grew up with a certain idea about what a sewing machine was, what it was supposed to do, um, what I could expect from it, what it could expect from me. And I was happy with that. I am change resistant. I really am. So this machine is, is just beautiful. Um, let me see. It, it was listed for $95, which is a really good price for a machine like this in good working condition. Uh, but I got it for closer to 85 because I paid cash and they give you uh, a discount for paying cash. And I try to pay cash when I shop locally. I, if I'll go to a chain store or something, I really, you know, it's like they build that sort of 3% credit card fee into their overhead. It doesn't mean very much to them. And quite frankly, most of the stores I'm going to these days are, uh, they prefer credit cards. Uh, I, I'll see signs saying, due to the national coin shortage, like, please. Even when they were saying we had a national coin shortage, this was a year ago, we didn't, in fact, have a national coin shortage. And now they're using this as some sort of bizarre excuse to get us to use cards no, I'll pay cash. Thank you very much. I really don't want you to know that much about my business. Uh, but when I'm dealing with local companies, I'll do cash because I don't want to give them that 3% credit card fee. I know a lot of these businesses are, what well, they don't have a slush fund to cover emergencies or whatever. And saving them 3% if I can, especially since it means nothing to me one way or the other. It doesn't cost me more to do it. Uh, it doesn't cost me less to use a card. It's, it's all the same to me. So why not do it in a way that makes life easier on them? Anyway, this is uh, a portable sewing machine. It is now anyway. It was intended to be a portable sewing machine from the get-go. Now, the sewing machine uh, has a, a cover, a, a coffin is what it's called. And that comes from the fact that 
the early sewing machines, the treadle sewing machines, sat on little tables. Uh, they were actually built into a little table, and there was a lovely wooden box that you would drop over the top of it as a dust cover, and that lovely little wooden box looked just like a coffin. By the way, uh, sewing machine coffins are very useful as cord corrals. And I have them under my various desks. If I have a computer somewhere, I have a sewing machine coffin next to it. And that is holding all of this, uh, these cords and um, uh, adapters and all this junk. Oh, it's just all this giant stuff, and then you have to have the surge protector. They're all over the place. And what I do with that stuff is I heap it into a little box, stick it down there, and drop a sewing machine coffin over the top of it. Everything's still where it needs to be, and it's not unsightly anymore. So, just a little tip. And I really do like sewing machine coffins. They're beautiful. Uh, they were wonderfully designed, uh, great, uh, solid wood, and you can get them for, usually around here, I get them for anywhere from 15 to $30. I'm going to say the usual price is 20 to 25 and, um, and depending on condition, of course, but most of the ones that I find locally are in really good condition very beautiful, very decorative, house my cords, and I can even put stuff on top of it if I want to. Oh, I love that. So, the lid, the coffin, before I got distracted, on this sewing machine uh, needed a key to lock it in place. Then you could pick it up by the handle on the top and transport it around. Well, the lock works, but I don't have a key for it. Now, I could certainly find a key. Yes, baby, I'm right here. Uh, I could find a key, and I will keep my eye out for a key. All right, you can come. I will keep my eye out for a key. If I come across a key, fantastic. But I can't just leave the sewing machine sitting in the middle of the kitchen floor because I can't pick it up and move it. Um, obviously, you know, I could pick it up from the bottom, but then the cover starts to slide off. It was just, no. It needed some locks to hold that cover in place. So I went on eBay. I knew the kind of lock I wanted. Now, here's the problem with this. I don't know if they actually have a name. I've seen them described as clasp locks, as clamp locks, as toggle locks, as mill spec, in other words, military specification locks, toolbox locks I've also seen them described as. So I went to eBay, I threw every combination of those terms into the search engine and eventually came up with the locks that I bought. They are vintage, I was happy with that. Uh, the catches do not match the clasps. I was not happy about that. But if it really drives me crazy over time, I'll get some paint. I'll paint them out to match the old brass. So, let's take a look at the project. So, here is my new old sewing machine. Now, the machine... Uh, well, let me just give you a quick tour of this. Look at the wonderful painting on that thing. This is just lovely. And it works. So, let me see if you can see this. See the way the needle's going up and down? Now, obviously, when it's plugged in, it works better. But we're not plugging it in right now. We are going to deal with the fact that this machine weighs um, almost 24 pounds, uh, 23 pounds, 10 ounces, I believe. And the cover, which is right over here, weighs another 4 pounds, 10 ounces. 
So just those two pieces alone, we're looking at 29 pounds plus there is Yes, welcome to my neighborhood. Um, they're just not quiet around here. The cord, which is uh, an older cord, a lot thicker, a lot heavier, plus it has um, a pedal on it that I believe is cast iron. I'll have to weigh that and let you know what the full weight is when I'm done with this. But even those two pieces alone, we're looking at almost 30 pounds. So, if we go back over to the cover, you'll notice there is a very convenient carry handle. However, because I do not have a key for the lock, I cannot use the carry handle. So I've got to cart this thing around under my arm. That's what we are going to address today. So here's the cover. And please notice this little piece right here. It's just um, a little uh, clasp, if you will, that goes in here and catches. So this side is secure. As secure as this little bit of steel is going to make it. And actually, that's pretty gosh darn secure. Look at the size of those screws. So, that side is good. It's the other side that doesn't work properly. So, let me show you what happens. When I lock this in on this side, and let's see, yes, okay, we are secure on that side. without being able to lock this side down, if I pick it up with the handle, watch what happens. This side just lifts right up. So, I have a solution for this. I got some class blocks. I got a set of two. I got them on eBay and let me just show you it's the underside. Now, because I bought these online, I didn't realize until I got them that the catches do not match the locks. Brass steel. All right. Well, that fell. Serves me right for trying to photograph this on top of a curved sewing machine cabinet. This, this is how they come together. So you secure this down on one side, this down on the other, and then when you lift this, it flips out and allows you to grab the catch. Um, it will be more clear as we are going ahead. I really need two hands to demonstrate the way this works, and unfortunately, uh, I need a third hand to hold the camera. So, this is how I'm going to do it. I chose these locks because they are clearly vintage. You can see how old that brass is, and I didn't want to put something brand new uh, on the sewing machine. On the other hand, if I had realized it was going to be a brass and steel combination, I might well have gotten something brand new and antiqued it myself. Um, which, by the way, we can do with brass. We've talked about that before. But this is what I have. They are very, very sturdy catches. So, uh, I don't think we're going to have a problem in terms of the functionality of this. All right, um, I am going to recover that other lock and we're going to get started. Now, before I did any of this, I made sure to clean the surface of the case. 
Um, we have some very nicely grained oak. I believe the graining on this portion is painted on. Um, but here we have some real wood, which is good because we want something for the screws to grab into. So here is the lock and the lock mechanism in here is fairly large. It runs about this big. We want to stay away from that because we need wood. And in here, it will have been routed out so they could have put in the metal lock mechanism. So the first thing we do, well, after we clean, is line the, the two surfaces up. Now, one of the reasons that I chose the style of lock that I did is because it's not perfectly flush. And neither is this cabinet. This, I don't know if you can see over here, it comes out a little. Um, it's, it's not perfectly level. And we've got a little piece of, of sort of routed out trim here. A surface bolt wouldn't do the trick. And quite frankly, I don't think I'd be too crazy about trusting 30 pounds to a surface bolt. So, I'm going to line up the two locks on either side here. Now, I stuck them in my pocket, by the way, which is why I kind of have to fish around for them. Um, uh, fishing around for them is a lot better, frankly, than dropping them and having to pick them up again. Now, because the way this closes, you see how it closes? That is the closed position. I don't want to affix. See, there we go. I dropped it again. I knew there was a reason I kept it in my pocket. It's okay. We've got another one. Now, as I was saying, the reason I here, there. the reason I don't want to put it like on like this with the larger piece on the case is because it simply opens like that. I want the piece to go together like this so that when it is clamped down, it's less likely to snap open. So this piece is going to be lined up on the bottom section and the little clip is going to be on the top section. Now, if you'll notice, because of the way these little catches are made, it very neatly bridges over all of this fancy work and makes allowances for the fact that this surface is, uh, well, this surface is a little proud of that surface. That's how they describe it. This comes out a little farther. And this ring, which floats freely, will simply automatically adjust for that. So I could do it like this. It, will, it would hold about anywhere from where it is to maybe as much as half an inch uh, in terms of difference in the surface. So, Sharpie locks. I'm going to mark the holes next. And I'm going to start with these pieces. So I have one of the latches in place. And what I need to do now is put the catch in place. And the way I do that is I simply hold this, uh, and I will be doing that with two hands. I will hold it in place here with the catch secured. And then I will mark my holes. I'm not going to measure, I'm going to let the lock tell me where the catch needs to go. And that way I know it will work perfectly. 
All right, we'll be back in a minute. Okay, so we have one of the locks installed. Now, when I put this catch in, I set this screw, then I pulled my little ring up, checked the fit, and then set the second screw. Now listen for this. That is a tight hold. Now, it needs to be because it's carrying 30 pounds. And the last thing in the world I want to do is go around carrying a 30 pound sewing machine buy a handle on the top, have the bottom come loose, fall down, and this machine is cast iron, it will shatter. So, I'm going to put the second lock over here. I'm gonna line them up so they're reasonably even, and then we'll come back and take a look at the finished product. Okay, so here we go. We've got our two locks. Uh, now, here comes the real test. We pick it up, and nothing stayed behind. Now, all I can say is housewives in the 1940s had to be pretty gosh darn strong because they would have been picking up 30-some pounds with a small handle and one hand. So... Now the portable sewing machine is back to being portable once again. As you can see, this is a really useful kind of lock if you need to join two flush or reasonably flush surfaces together. The sort of thing where you might consider using a slide bolt to connect them. Um, the thing that comes to my mind is jewelry boxes because they hardly ever have catches that are worth anything and i don't know about yours but i have a jewelry box that holds my earrings just fun earrings and if that flimsy little catch goes i will be picking up earrings off the floor for the next two years audie will be helping me and believe me his idea of helping is to grab an earring and run away with it. And I'll end up stepping on it at two in the morning when I'm in my bare feet. There are so many good uses for locks like this. And they have modern versions as well as the antique ones that I got. I think the antique ones have more style. But they're very inexpensive. Um, mine were not very inexpensive. I paid $15 for the pair not inexpensive, not compared to what I could have gotten if I had been willing to go over to a bright, shiny chrome lock that was made yesterday, but I wasn't. The sewing machine is old, and I was picky, frankly, because this is going to be on a sewing machine that I am going to use, and I'm going to be seeing it every day. And a nice new shiny lock that doesn't match is just going to get on my nerves. So, $15 for the don't get on my nerves factor. They are readily available. And as I say, I paid a lot for mine. Um, much more than you would have to pay for modern locks like this. Very useful. And my sewing machine was not too perfectly flush surfaces. The lid, the coffin, was just a, a touch shy of matching up to the base. That's because of all that little um, routed out molding. So a lock like this with a loose ring, it's very forgiving for surface uh, unevenness. Uh, so that was another plus in going for that kind of lock. Also, when those little buggers snap shut, you really have to work to open them. And if it's going to be supporting the weight of a 30-pound machine, now mind you, this is 30 pounds 
before I throw the cord in there. And I said I was going to weigh the cord for you, and I didn't. Um, I'll catch you up on that at some future date. This, this is what my sewing machine cord weighs. The cord probably weighs a good two pounds uh, because it's older and it's got uh, a cast iron pedal. Um, yeah, I know there are some advantages to modern plastic machines, but I hate them. So I needed something that could support the weight because if that machine falls, it, it if the lid comes off the base and the machine goes down, it's done for. So that's why I made the choice I did. Very useful lock. Uh, the fact that it's called a toolbox lock certainly tells you um, how useful it is for heavy duty applications. And that's what I consider this to be. So hopefully you will be able to just sort of Hold this in the back of your head and keep it in mind in case you need to batten down your toolbox. It's a relatively easy process to put um, these catches in. Um, I used new screws because mine didn't come with screws either. Um, and I would not have gotten steel screws if, in fact, the visible screws were not up against those little steel catches. Um, I would have gone for brass screws and either let them age or artificially age them myself. That's a very easy thing to do. We've talked about it before. We can do that in a future project if you're interested. Okay, future projects in case you're interested. I am going to need to clean and oil the machine. I'm happy to film that if that's something that would catch your fancy. Um, there are a couple of YouTube sewing channels that I watch. So I thought I would just give you, you know, while we're on the subject of sewing, give you a little heads up on those. Um, Evelyn Wood. Now, this is not the same Evelyn Wood that pioneered speed reading in the mid 20th century. She was an American educator. This one is an Australian seamstress. She looks like she just stepped out of the 1930s. She really does. She's got a 1930s face. And she teaches sewing. Good, clean, simple sewing. Excellent channel. Uh, also, the closet historian. Again, she both of these women deal in vintage items, but uh, that one is Bianca Esposito. She deals in um, mostly mid-century clothing, a lot of sewing techniques. She's very good for explaining how to modify patterns. Two great channels. There are a lot of sewing channels on YouTube. The big ones, the really popular ones, are mostly cosplayers. Uh, so that doesn't really appeal to me because I'm not looking for someone to show me how to make a Renaissance dress. You know, especially not on a sewing machine because if you want to make a, an authentic Renaissance dress, you're doing it with a needle and thread. And I do not have time in my life to sew some flowing gown, dragging along behind me on the floor, having my cat jump on it with a needle and thread that would take literally, literally weeks. So, no, those are not the programs that really engage me. Although, you know, I love to watch the cosplayers. I think they are just, just darling. It's so much fun. They have a good time. Bless their hearts. But if I want to look at sewing, I want to go to seamstresses. That's what Evelyn Wood is. And you know, I love the Aussies again, so that's that's just an added bonus. Or I want someone who has uh, a technical education, like Bianca Esposito, that's the closet historian, and can actually take me through the process of pattern drafting. So just thought I would share those with you. They are my favorite sewing channels. 
except there is this wonderful young woman, and I cannot remember her name, uh, who deals with Chinese sewing techniques. At some point, I'll go look her name up. She's delightful, and she has some sewing techniques that are very different from the Western techniques I grew up on. All right, enough about sewing. That's the machine. As you can tell, I'm excited with my new birthday present. I have a new slideshow for you. Um, Lisa, our resident artist from Desert Dragon Works, has a new grandchild. She also has another grandchild she's had for a while. And that's what the slideshow is. The new little one, Rebel, and Rebel's older sister, Marley. Um, and I'm so sad that Marley doesn't live in my area because I'm telling you, she would be my new best friend. I think that kid, uh, what personality, it just jumps out at you. So, Lisa, thank you for the pictures. We are all really going to enjoy seeing the new grandbaby. All right. Have a great day, everyone. I will see you next week, Thursday, for Just Chatting, where we're going to have some fun. And then Saturday and Sunday, we're going to go back to our usual thrifting videos. Have a great week.